A few years ago, my friend Jane and I took a trip to Portland, Oregon. We're both from the south side of Chicago when Jane was feeling pretty jaded with the city. She was convinced that everything was better on the west coast, including the people. So we flew out to Portland and rented a car, which we named Veronica. The day before we were supposed to fly back home, we took Veronica and drove up to Aberdeen, Washington to see Kurt Cobain's childhood home. After that, we drove down the coast, sightseeing along the way. We visited Astoria, Oregon to see the house from the Goonies, and ended the day at Cannon Beach to check out Haystack Rock. All in all, it was a pretty nice day. Once it started to get dark, we decided to head back to our hotel, which was just under two hours away. I knew that I needed gas, so I told Jane I would stop at the first gas station I see. Cannon Beach is a small resort-type town, a lot of little shops and restaurants, but I didn't see any gas stations. Being from the city, I'm used to seeing two on every corner, so I wasn't really worried. I expected to find one soon. I am completely unfamiliar with the area, so I just keep following the GPS's instructions while talking to Jane. Next thing I know, we're not in any type of town. We're on a dark, winding road surrounded by trees. At this point, I'm getting a little worried. I pull over to the side of the road to use the GPS to search for the nearest gas station. It tells me there's one about a mile down the road. Awesome. I'll get some gas and we'll be set. So I'm driving and Veronica tells us that we arrived at our destination. I pull into a completely dark and empty gas station. We're still surrounded by woods and darkness. As far as I can tell, there's nothing around for miles. According to Veronica, we have about 10 miles worth of gas, and the nearest gas station is 30 miles away. Jane and I are sitting there trying to figure out what to do when another car pulls in. I keep going about my business and don't really pay attention to the other car. I just assume they need gas too. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone gesturing to me. After some hesitation, I crack the window to see what they want. There's a middle-aged man and his wife in the car. He starts asking us all kinds of questions. Need a fill up? Coming from the beach? Driving back to Portland? I keep my answers polite but short. Then he tells us he actually owns the gas station we're at, but doesn't make enough money to keep it open that late. He tells us that he knows of a Chevron about three miles away and gives us directions for it. He gave us his number and says to give him a call in case we don't make it to the Chevron. My name is Sam, the mechanic. Let me know if you don't make it and I'll come rescue you ladies. We thank him profusely and head out. Jane is going on and on how nice that was and how that never would have happened in Chicago. I agreed. That was very nice, if not odd, of him. Strange that he happened to be driving past his gas station at the same time we pulled in, but whatever. I make a joke about him calling his buddy at the gas station saying, I'm sending two women your way. We make it to the Chevron and this kid, 18 or 19 years old, comes out to pump our gas. He asks us how we're doing and then says, there's a lot of weirdos out here tonight. Jane and I look at each other and I let out a small laugh and say, ha, told you. I turn back to the kid and ask him what he means. He tells me this story, how his brother owes some drug dealer a ton of money, and how he's hiding somewhere nearby. He's planning on kicking the shit out of him once he gets off his shift. I can tell Jane is getting uncomfortable with the building weirdness of the night, so I give the kid a good tip, wish him luck, and start driving again. At one point during our conversation, Jane calls Sam the Mechanic Man and leaves him a voicemail. She tells him we made it to the gas station and how much we appreciate his help. I thought the call was unnecessary. It is what it is. A few minutes later, we're on the highway and about 10 minutes from our hotel. Jane's phone rings and it's Sam. Again, she thanks him profusely. He asks her where we're from and when we're flying home. He tells her his name is Sam Glesty, and he wrote a book called Wrongly Accused. We should read it on our plane ride home. This piqued my interest. Jane, you have to look up that book to see what it's about. She googles it. Then she goes limp and looks like she's going to puke. What is it? He was accused of being the Green River Killer. Immediately she starts freaking out. He has my number now. Back at the hotel, we do some more digging. Apparently, a victim of the Green River serial killer picked Sam out of a lineup. However, the real killer was caught and convicted based on DNA evidence. But around the same time in the 70s, Sam was convicted and served time for abducting and assaulting a young woman in the area we were in. The book he wrote was about all of that. We ended up stuck in Portland for two more days due to a snowstorm in Chicago. It was a weird, tension-filled two days. Considering the circumstances and weirdness of that night, things could have gone horribly wrong. I'm glad all I got out of that night was a story.
This happened a couple of months ago. My husband and I live in Everett, Washington, just north of Seattle. It was probably about 8 p.m. when my husband decided to take the car and fuel it up at the closest gas station from our house. It's not abnormal and I decided to stay home with our, at the time, four-month-old. My husband had been gone quite a while and I started to get nervous, as I always do. Most women would think their man was cheating or something, but I am always convinced he is dead or super hurt. But I couldn't call him because I saw that he had forgotten his phone at home. Well, eventually he comes home in a panic. He is always playing this macho, nothing can hurt me kind of personality, but this time he was visibly shaken and horrified. That's when he explained what had happened. He pulled up to the gas station as they were closing the convenience store part of it, and noticed a weird guy lingering around. Of course, thinking he is invincible, he chooses to pump his gas anyways, because he doesn't feel like he should leave just because there is a creepy guy. And obviously creepy guy approaches him, and is shaking and has his hand in his pocket. He starts off by mentioning that my husband must be doing very well considering he's driving a Lexus. Then he told my husband that he needed a ride to Forest Park, just up the road from the gas station because his car broke down, because he is a pastor at a Korean church. My husband is skeptical immediately given this guy's appearance, and the fact that he was clearly Caucasian. So my husband told him, No, it's just up the road. Just walk. The guy kept pleading and my husband stood his ground. Creepy guy then asks if he can borrow my husband's phone to make a call, to which my husband told him that he forgot his phone at home which was true, but the guy wouldn't believe him and challenged him by asking, then what's in your left pocket? My husband said, my keys. Then he asked about his right pocket, and my husband said, my gun. The guy kind of laughed, not believing my husband. Mind you, my husband is 23 and Chinese, so he looked really young and vulnerable. The guy asked for a ride again, and my husband said no once again as he was finishing up pumping his gas. The creepy guy went to the other side of the car and tried opening it up to get inside. My husband asked him what the hell he was doing and to back off. Then the guy starts coming at my husband while holding on to something in his pocket. That is when my husband made the judgment to pull his gun out and aim it at the guy. The guy stopped immediately and threw his hands up in the air and backed up slowly while my husband told him to get away. The most chilling thing this man said was, You're a very smart man and he kept backing away slowly. My husband sped off with the gun still pointed the whole time. I am so thankful I stayed home with our daughter, and now I am extra paranoid when he is a little late. I am not entirely sure what the guy intended, if he wanted to rob my husband or steal the car, but he was clearly going through some drug withdrawals, or on something, and his last statement just confirmed that he was up to no good. I live about 20 miles from the city in which I work. I live out in the country, and about a short walking distance from my house is a highway, and on the corner is a 24-7 gas station. Last week, Saturday night, I went by there right before midnight to grab some Cajun peanuts. I see one car parked on the side, which is normal, usually just a guy working and rarely any customers at this time. Do you ever feel this dread overcome you? Like you know something is wrong. Well, I walk in and don't see anyone. Nobody behind the counter or in the store. So I take my time and assume they are in the bathroom or step to the back of the store. Surely they heard the chime on the door when I came in. I'm feeling weird and uncomfortable. So I wait a minute even though it seemed like forever. So I call out. Anyone here? I wait a minute more and put the peanuts down and walk out the door. I check the car parked on the side, and there wasn't anything troubling. I even glanced on the back side of the store and there was nobody. I'm pretty uncomfortable so I just call the police. They show up 10 to 15 minutes later, but it really did feel like an hour, and they search the place. They find the cashier dead in the men's bathroom, beaten to death. They called in backup, asked me to recap what I experienced, and then I went home. That ain't even the fucked up part. So I get home and my dog is in the front yard pissing, just staring at me. He is an inside dog, and my front door is cracked open. My heart is racing so I grab my dog and head back to the gas station and let the police know. They send one of the guys to search my house. Nothing is stolen or out of place, but there was sign of forced entry. 
So this was last week, and about five hours ago I get a call from my brother, who works for the county sheriff's office. Supposedly, they pulled the camera footage and about 10 minutes before I walked into the store, someone came in, started punching on the cashier, and then dragged him into the bathroom. On the footage, you can see me walk in and look around and call out, and then you can see me walk out and check out the car, walk to my vehicle, and make a call. About the time I'm in the vehicle, the alleged murderer walks out of the bathroom and sneaks out the back door. And before leaving the view of the camera, he takes off in the general direction of my house. Fortunately, my wife was out with some friends watching Beauty and the Beast again. But I'm convinced that I missed a murderer at the gas station and then he broke into my house. This week, I had a new security system installed alongside a new front door. But I'm pretty sure whoever did this is still out there. About 10 years ago, I worked for a short time at a small gas station close by to my house. Both of my kids had started school, and we always needed extra money. I was about 26 or 27, and had not ever really worked anywhere before, but it was fun. We stayed a little busy throughout the day as there were three factories very close by, and we get a lot of our traffic from the employees there, especially at shift change times. One weekday, mid-morning, I was working by myself, which was unusual, but my manager who usually worked days with me was out sick. No big deal. It was no more than I could handle. There were people in and out all morning, and nothing out of the ordinary was happening, until a transfer truck pulls in and parks to the side of the building. We didn't carry diesel fuel, but it wasn't unusual to have big trucks pull in for drinks, bathroom, whatever. The driver walks in, tall guy, not unattractive, but a little creepy looking. He had a huge refillable coffee mug and asked me if there was fresh coffee and could he refill his mug. I told him no problem. He refills his mug and comes up to pay and starts chit-chatting. He told me that he had a delivery for one of the factories up the street and asked what would be the best way to get there. So I told him, no big deal happens all the time. He then started telling me he was from Arkansas and that after he dropped his load, he was headed back home for a few days. I was just politely nodding my head. Then he asked me if there was a restroom. I told him yes and pointed to where it was, but did not come out from behind the counter. He starts trying to chat with me again without going to the restroom. He asked me if I was working alone, and that's when all kinds of signals start going off in my head. I told him my coworker had to run an errand and would be right back. He winds up staying in there for about 20 minutes trying to small talk, and ask me at least six or seven times where the restroom is. During this time, customers were coming in and out, and when someone would come in, he would walk around the store, kind of hide behind the shelves. At this point, I am trying to stay calm, and figure out what I need to do to get him the hell out of there. I looked out at the gas pumps, and I saw a man from one of the factories up the street on a forklift, filling it with gas. When he comes in, I was trying to start a conversation and ask him stupid questions to get him to look at my face so I could gesture where creepy guy was standing behind the potato chips. He didn't catch the hint until he walked out of the door and turned back to look at me and I mouthed to him, help me. He turns around and comes back in and by this time creepy guy had come out from behind the potato chips. Forklift guy asks me if I'm okay and I tell him no. He asks me if I need help and I say yes. All of this being said very low where creepy guy cannot hear. All of a sudden forklift guy runs around the chips and slams creepy guy into the coke cooler, telling him that the lady wants him to leave. Get the fuck out. Creepy guy runs out, jumps into his truck, and hightails it out of there, while forklift guy stays with me until I call police and they get there. I make a report, gave best description I could, called a co-worker to come and stay with me and the police and the forklift guy leave. About an hour later, one of the cops come back in to tell me that they caught the guy speeding on the highway leading out of town. He not only had an empty trailer on the back of his truck, he had not been to drop his load. He didn't leave in that direction, and no way did he have time to get to the factory, unload, and get back out to where he was pulled over in that amount of time. But he also had a pistol that had been reported stolen in Alabama, and had just been released from prison, where he had served two years for rape and was wanted in Missouri for not reporting into his probation officer after being released. I have no clue why he was in a transfer truck, or what the hell he was doing in small town Georgia, but he clearly wasn't making his rounds through the southeast. I quit that job within a week, 
never worked in a gas station ever again. Note that I am not a native English speaker, and this is the second story where being multilingual has somehow helped me. I recently drove from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Buffalo, New York with my cat. The ride was long, but we were making decent time for the most part. She and I had gotten up toward right before you got into New York. It was around 5.30 p.m., but that also meant it was around pitch black out too. We'd only stopped once to get something at McDonald's, and I drank their iced tea quickly to try to stay awake. I definitely had to pee. I didn't want to leave my cat in the car, so I put her leash on, and we walked into the gas station. I said, do you mind if we use the restroom here? The man behind the counter said, sure, and she and I entered into the bathroom. She sat on the counter while I did my thing. The store wasn't empty. There were some dudes around browsing for honey buns, tasty cake, and cheaper cigarettes than those in New York. There was a woman talking to counter guy up front. She was probably like a regular based on their seeming familiarity with each other. My cat jumped about a foot when we heard the doorknob rattle. I laughed and said, sorry, it's occupied right now. My cat is a trained animal. She is trained to handle people, stimulating situations, crowds, and relatively loud noise. She hates cars, though. I looked over at her after the jump and her tail was as full as could be, and she got low and slipped up to her favorite position on my shoulders. She dug into my hair with her nails and did her little grumble at me that she does when she wants to be let outside. The doorknob rattled again and she reached out toward the door, like in a quick way, like a strike. It's still occupied, I called out, but I wasn't laughing this time. We then heard someone speak. It was a man's voice, and honestly, it kind of made my blood run cold. They were speaking a cousin of my native language. They were saying, should I grab her when she comes out? And in my native tongue, grab doesn't really have the multiple connotations like it does in English. They used what was similar to take, as far as I could tell through the door. No, the cashier is right there. We can go outside. I think her car is the blue one. My cat did her angry grumble bug sound, and I tried to pet her to reassure her. There weren't any windows in this bathroom and my car was parked, unwisely, around the side of the lot. I parked it a little away from the lights because I had a lot of stuff in it and didn't want the items to be lit. It was not the blue one. We heard their steps retreat and we sat there for what felt like a long time. We both jumped when we heard a knock on the door. Come out quickly and my girlfriend will lead you through the back to your car. They're standing out by the pumps. It was the counter guy and who I thought was the regular. I opened the door and she ushered me to the back. Not smart, but like I don't know what else to do. She opened the door and I could see my car about 20 feet away. I wanted to sprint, but I remembered I used my key thing to set the alarm. I unlocked the car with my keys and the alarm went off. I threw myself into the driver's seat, unlocked it with the key thing, and quickly pressed the button to lock it again. I felt my heart in my throat as I threw the car into reverse and got the fuck out of there. On my way out, I noticed the guy standing near the blue car on the other side of the lot, trying to nonchalantly smoke. They didn't even know I got out. 